just a bucket. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much the organizers um, for, for this invitation and for their hard work to bring us uh, all together here. It's, uh, I have the feeling that it's going to be a really nice conference. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a project that we started uh, last summer um, and uh, that concerns um, a collective, let me sit here so that I see what I'm talking about, um, collective effects in, in viruses, um, um, which um, we think they uh, hold uh, major roles in, uh, in assembly and form and stability. Um, and as such, they carry a, a, an integral part of the physics of virus function and also of uh, new virus-based technologies in which we are uh, interested. Um, here is an example of a mechanical kind of illustration of collective properties. And that's one of my favorite toys. Perhaps some of you too play with this. Um, you have magnetic beads that make a, a, an icosahedral T equals 3 structure. And uh, if you want to solve this puzzle, you start to add beads one by one, and you have choices of uh, where do you want to start. Here I start with a hexamer. Yeah, the pentamers are in blue. I start with a hexamer and I form a, let's say, let's call it an intermediate of assembly. And what you may notice is that it looks a lot like just a, a hemisphere plucked out of the original structure. But so we start here with a pentamer. Um, it has a five-fold symmetry. It has a jagged edge where I'm adding particles. Now here, these magnetic beads were put together by starting at the two-fold symmetry axis. And uh, you see that the line, the, the edge, the growth edge here, has, is not as jagged as this one. So what does that tell me? It tells me that regardless the interaction potential between the particles, which remains the same between the two intermediates, I'm going to affect the growth mode due to the fact that as I add particles, I'm straining the intermediate mechanically. This type of stress that I, I add uh, as I grow my puzzle is a collective effect. The line tension, as Rob would call it, I guess, um, it de depends, its jaggedness depends not only on the interaction potential between particles, but what, how we grew this and what, how much curvature strain you have there. In other words, how many intrinsic defects, if you want, versus normal hexagonal lattice points you have in your capsid as you grow it. So that's an example of mechanical collective effect uh, that uh, I think many people here are interested in, and, and, and uh, like uh, Roya and Martin Castelnova is going gonna, is gonna to give us a talk, I think, later in the week about it. But what I would like to talk about is this idea of coherence of interactions that leads to new properties. And I'm going to talk about something very different from mechanics. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, super radiance, about a photonic type of... Um, of um, mechanism or, or application. And so that we get everybody, uh, I, I saw how many people were reluctant in, in saying that they are physicists, didn't know whether they should you know, raise their hand or not, which is a good thing. I think it, it shows that this is a nice and heterogeneous uh, crowd. But so that we have everybody on the same page in, in terms of, at least in terms of what I'm going to talk about, I would like to point out of um, uh, the, the phenomenon, a phenomenon that in my mind is reminiscent of what I'm going to talk about. And this, um, you know, the Westerners perhaps is, are not very um, uh, used with this kind of 
uh, social behavior, but this is um, if they if they would like to learn more about it, they can. Uh, oh, sorry, they can read about this paper in in this paper about it. What you know, in Eastern Europe, we had this. Um, we had sometimes to listen to demagogues talking, and uh, although they were very boring, uh, we had to please them by showing enthusiasm at the end of their talks. And so, how would we do that? Uh, you clap your hands, but you just can clap only that hard, right? However, if you start clapping at unison, the contrast between the sound that you produce, and then the sort of the, the no sound is so great that the enthusiasm is apparent. And so this is what happens. These guys actually put a microphone in a conference room, and I do not know who was talking. It's actually not relevant. But uh, they put a microphone in a conference room, and he's, here you have wide noise of, uh, noise of people clapping their hands incoherently. And then suddenly, you know, listening to their neighbors, they start to build up this unison clapping, yeah? And, and they get what I will call during my talk super radiance. Without using more power, you use coherence to create higher contrast. Okay, so um, this is the idea here, the, that the new properties arise when there is a well-defined phase relationship among the microscopic constituents of a material. In our case, we are going to talk about capsids. And there is a good, well-defined phase relationship, especially if the, the capsids are symmetric. So the premise is that if, you, if your constituents have a quantum character. Molecules do tend to have that character. And they are located in a spatially coherent pattern. You have quantum symmetry enforced selection rules. In other terms, when you do transitions between the states of these symmetrically placed constituents, you are going to end up starting from spatial coherence, you are going to end up with collective temporal co coherence. In other words, well, in a more formal way, Fermi put this, well, Dirac actually, 20 years before Fermi, in, ter in terms of, his, uh, of the Fermi golden rule, this is, this is the rate of changing from the initial state to the final state, and you have here the symmetries of the initial state, the final state encoded in this scalar product, in which also you have the Hamiltonian of the perturbation that is going to be, in my case, the, electronic, the electromagnetic field, which defines the whole symmetry of the problem. And the symmetry of the solution has to be to have the symmetry of, of uh, the, the Hamiltonian. And the result then is that new dynamic properties Starting with this premise, new dynamic properties, so, some of which are impossible to create in systems near the thermodynamic limit, are going to result. Okay, so what examples do do I can uh, can I can I tell you? Uh, we have this great example from uh, photosynthesis, where energy transport at mesoscopic scales can be much more efficient in quantum networks. So here we have a very simplified schematic of what happens in photosynthesis, where you have light harvesting complexes that are at the heart of the process, in which you have uh, often a symmetric arrangement in a ring-like structure of chromophores that are self-assembled. Now, what happens there, they are so tight together that when the light comes in, a photon gets absorbed, and they are so tight together, these dyes or chromophores, that their electronic wave functions know of each other. And so when the photon gets absorbed, it creates like ripples, if you want, in the electronic wave function of the entire uh, chromophore ring. And those ripples of energy are called excitons. Now, excitons, in quantum mechanics can travel not only 
like particles, let's say, following a trajectory, but they can be in two places at the same time. And that's what makes the transport of excitons very efficient. So if that happens, uh, you can transfer this energy from the photon from far away to the reaction center here, where the actual chemistry that is important for photosynthesis happens. Yeah, so um, another example uh, or sort of thing to keep in mind is that if you have any independent oscillators, and this is also a, a, um, a classical kind of picture, if you have any independent oscillators, the co their collective response are going, is going to be, uh, in terms of signal to noise ratio, limited by square root of n. But if you have a coherent ensemble of uh, oscillators, the signal to noise ratio, when you measure things, is going to be proportional with n. And therefore, you can switch between states, for example, with less energy. This is why we are interested, uh, because if we can make, let's say, molecular photonic circuits that are quantum uh, coherent in nature, uh, it will take less switching energy. Now, let's get a little bit more concrete. Our question here is whether the structural fidelity of self-assembled virus-like particles, which one is depicted here, uh, in our case, we like to play with uh, metal nanoparticles inside the virus shell that is grown on the surface of the metal nanoparticle. So no RNA here, just a big blob of metal. Um, but the structural fidelity of the capsid, the question is whether it can be harnessed to control dynamics in the way I told you, from symmetry to uh, temporal uh, coherence, and uh, control this way the dynamics of collective excitation uh, of energy conversion. So I would come with a photon, I would have a bunch of chromophores on the capsid placed at uh, identical uh, uh, symmetric locations, and uh, the chromophores would then absorb in a collective fashion and it would discharge their energy in collective fas fashion to, a, to another, uh, instead of a reaction center, instead of a bunch of molecules that can harvest that energy in, into separations, molecular separations, you would have a, uh, a plasmon, uh, that this gold particle or metal particle will have a collective ex uh, oscillation of uh, free electrons that, uh, that is called a plasmon that can be coupled with that. High well, electrons, these electrons that, that uh, are um, undergoing the, the plasmon uh, oscillation, they are hot, and therefore you can create uh, conditions for chemical reactions. Look at, if we look at the scales of what I just uh, mentioned in terms of uh, the, the uh, chromophores organized in uh, light harvesting complexes, this is uh, 100 nanometers, uh, sorry, this is 10 nanometers, this is 10 nanometers bar here. You can see that the uh, rings of chromophores that we would form uh, are comparable with the rings of chlorophyll chromophores that uh, form in bacterial uh, chlorophyll. So chances are, chances are that we are going to look at the same uh, or a similar type of physics. Now, um, there are some fundamental phenomena of interest here, like enhanced optical absorption, something that I will talk about uh, here. It's called a decay superradiance. There's a unison clapping of hands, if you want. Uh, then there is enhanced plasmon coupling, and which would produce hot electrons for photocatalysis. Um, and uh, the consequence of the superradiance behavior uh, which is going to be at the heart of this talk, is that we could create, in principle, deep sub-wavelength coherent light sources, which could be useful for photonics biomedical applications. In these very simplified cartoons, you're going to find out, we, we are, I'm going to cover it uh, and tell you that one, uh, one uh, symptom uh, of, uh, or, or, or um, sort of, uh, um, fingerprint of this collective 
behavior is that, that I call super radiance um, is the fact that the light is going to be, be emitted instead of being emitted isotropically, like from a, a, a bunch of dipoles that emit independently, here the light is going to be emitted directionally. So imagine that you have something like a surgical, surgical scalpel that goes, uh, an op these, these are optical uh, devices that, where you shoot actually ultra-fast pulses of light to the tissue. Now, what if with these ultra-fast pulses of light going on the tissue, you could detect these virus-like particles that are super radiant because they shoot the light right back at you? Yeah, that, that would be the sort of the far-fetched uh, application that, that we would be targeting with such concentrated sources of light. Um, so let's take a look at uh, a little at the uh, phenomena. There are a var variety of coupling mechanisms here that uh, affect optical absorption. Optical absorption is not going to, going to be similar or, or the same with uh, the optical absor absorption of uh, a bunch of independent chromophores that are disordered in a small volume. You are going to have, you could have strong coupling, like when the chromophores are really close together, you can create excitonic states, like those ripples in the electronic wave functions that I, I mentioned. Um, and you could have weak dipole-dipole uh, uh, coupling, like in the Forster energy transfer, uh, known as the Forster energy transfer, um, in which the chromophores will uh, organize the, the phases of their oscillations, but in, in, a, in a way that is uh, very different from overlapping of electronic wave functions. Um, one interesting thing uh, about uh, the, the two uh, possibilities here, uh, which are differentiated in terms of the distance between chromophores or the distance between nearest neighbors, is something that Greg Scholz mentioned in one of his papers. He noted that for photo photosynthesis, in order to have collective absorption, it's better to couple several molecules through weak dipole-dipole interactions that are weakly screened because the space between the molecules then extend a many electron system through space. You don't want to have pi conjugated bonds that make that ring. What you want is to have chromophores that self-assemble in order to get the right optical absorption. So that's one sort of quote that uh, stimulated our attention. Uh, an interesting um, uh, also difference in terms of optical absorption is what happens when you add a metal nanoparticle at the center of your chromophore array. Uh, because then you have every dipole is going to have an image in the metal, and if you have tail to head sort of orientation, which means when the dipole is perpendicular to the surface, you are going to have an enhancement because you have two dipoles, you see the mirror image, yeah? You have to, uh, an enhancement of the absorption. If the dipoles are parallel, you are going to have a suppression. So in order to see any type of effect, um, we have to control the location and orientation of these dipoles on the surface of our virus. We have to be mindful about these kind of strong distance and orientation depend, uh, uh, dependent effects. So going back to just an array of chromophores that, uh, that is organized into, let's say, a 30 nanometer kind of particle, so a very sub-wavelength particle. We are all familiar with uh, fluorescence and its isotropic emission when the chromophores are in solution and they are far away from each other. Uh, Emission is isotropic. A detector that can see the emission after uh, pulsed excitation would show a single exponential decay um, characterized by this uh, exponential uh, lifetime. If you have a volume that contains the detectors and they are at much shorter distances between them than the, the wavelength, then the prediction is, and this is Robert Dicke who did it for the first time in 1954, that you are going to get a coherent spontaneous radiation process by which the uh, emission is going to be anisotropic in the direction of the pump beam, and the detector will see, instead of an exponential like this, 
it will see uh, a post, uh, uh, the emission will be in a post fashion with the duration of that pulse being about the spontaneous lifetime over n, the number of chromophores that makes the ensemble. And so this was observed for ideal gases, and I, I'm going to point out why. It, it was observed for uh, gas phase, but also uh, later on in uh, uh, quantum dot and, and other type of uh, solid state um, uh, chromophores. But it was never done, well, the way we are trying to do it. Um, there are characteristic differences between normal fluorescence and superradiance, and I will point a few here that we are going to track uh, down during this uh, presentation. Um, one is um, that fluorescence emission, as you uh, know, is uh, the, that it has the intensity proportional with the number of emitters that you have in the beam, while the superradiant emission in the limiting case, the best case scenario, will have its intensity proportional with n square. At high density of chromophores, you expect quenching, and not only expect that you are going to see it unless you put those chromophores the right way. Uh, in uh, superradiant emission, you are going to see reduced to no quenching. One of the interesting things about the superradiant emission is that burst of energy is actually going to contain 100%. Uh, you can have 100% efficiency of conversion between pump beam and emitted uh, light. So there is reduced to no quenching. Then is, here you have mono-exponential decay, which is, this is the spontaneous lifetime. And there, in superradiant emission, you have a burst emission that, as I said, is shortened by the number of chromophores uh, that you are using on a particle. Moreover, if you only have an array of chromophores, it's going to emit either in free space or it will decay non-radiatively by collision and collisional um, um, decay. However, if you put a nanoparticle in, and the nanoparticle has these electromagnetic modes, as I said, called plasmons, uh, you can couple, instead of free space and shoot the light out um, as a, uh, fluorescent emission, you can couple with the oscillations here, and you have relaxed select selection rules with respect to coupling to photons. So you might end up with a lot more energy that goes into the plasmon, and then from the plasmon back into to another chromophore that would emit light. And we don't know yet what the pattern of emission from here would be. It was, interestingly, it just took off in 2010 with a, this uh, theoretical considerations that, that describe what I just said. Um, there is um, Tigran Shakhbazian um, who published a paper in 2010, and since then, then there is quite a bit of theory, but still is only theory, no experiments for the plasmonic decay effect, so superradiance, um, and the symmetry has not been included in any of these. What is it that's greater than one or equal to one? L. The quantum number? Yeah. Um, well, I saw that Angela Belcher actually saw super or at least quantum coherent cancer in viruses. And you said it has meant, is that something different? Angela Belcher published an article in Nature that she tested viruses to be quantum coherence. I don't know about it. Um, so, um, with, uh, with particle, with a uh, super, the I see. Mm -hmm. um, M13 is much larger than the wavelength, though. It's, it's a uh, cylindrical virus. Yes, I know. The diameter is less than the wavelength. The, um, 
length is much longer than the wavelength because, because um, um, Zvonimir Doji sees them with um, normal optical microscopy. It's a micron. It's a micron long. Um, <clears throat> so we are going to talk here about much smaller scales. Um, you have, when you have nanoparticles, you have a resonator, and you have a gain medium that comes from the chromophores, and the two ingredients give us the, this, what, we ask the question whether lasing conditions even could be met at this scale. Those are the conditions for a laser. The first claim was done by Noginov in 2009 of such a particle that, that emits coherent radiation, but the way they made it um, was uh, with a nanoparticle encased in a dye doped shell. Once again, the symmetry is not present in this case. So our objectives are to establish conditions or uh, to organize chromophores in a manner leading to cooperative photophysics at room temperature, that's important, and uh, determine whether the optical characteristics emerging from cooperative uh, uh, emission can be further enhanced by coupling to surface plasmons. And these are the works that I know of that looked at uh, the type of viruses we are looking at uh, labeled with dyes. Um, none of them treated the dynamics, the cooperative dynamics, as far as I know, of, uh, of uh, um, an ensemble of chromophores attached. The first is uh, uh, from uh, Nicole Steinmetz's group. The second uh, is from the second and the third, which are um, dealing with a synthesis. Uh, mostly are um, from uh, the uh, Matt Francis uh, group. And one very exciting and recent contribution is from Frank Sainsbury and George Lomonosov, who showed that you can actually produce GFP, so genetically modified viruses in plants, that have GFPs arrays instead of chromophores um, uh, that um, uh, well, it makes us think if we could design such particles, uh, whether we could actually establish protocols for obtaining them from obtaining these superradiant particles in, in plants. So the current experiments in our lab consist of synthesis by post-assembly virus chemical labeling by con co covalent conjugation of dyes. You have uh, the photophysical properties that we go through, uh, I will go through um, in, in terms of time resolved and steady state spe spectroscopy. The spectroscopic tuning of nanoparticles, um, we have accomplished that, but I'm not going to talk about uh, here today, um, as well as the nanoparticle directed self-assembly. And then structural properties, thermodynamic stability, and mechanical stability we will carry out. Um, we are, I'm not going to talk about um, much today, but we are carrying out as, as usual. So um, we will be looking at these two hallmarks, shortening of radiative lifetime as a function of N, and to the intensity as a function of N, the number of chromophores. The anisotropic emission we would like to look at it. We don't have the means right now. You have to do it in near field, so very close to the nanoparticle surface. But anyway, there is theoretical considerations that show that it should be quite directional, and that's an important, from the point of view of brightness, that's an important feature. Now, you have two, we have two things that, to keep in mind uh, about what challenges are down the road because those challenges include two phase-breaking processes that um, otherwise would, would be detrimental in, in, in seeing uh, super, super radiance. 
The first one is non-radiative population relaxation time described by the characteristic time T1. So you could have uh, quenching by non-radiative energy transfer, for, for instance. The second is polarization relaxation time when the dipoles are going to change uh, orientation before the superradiance happens. And so these two are captured by the cooperative frequency condition. So one over frequency, you have time. And there, are, there is a bunch of different parameters here. That, that characteristic time has to be less than the characteristic time for the two uh, population relaxations. So if you want to make the characteristic time for superradiance small, you have to use a small index of refraction, or you have to use a strong dipole uh, moment here, D, or you have to have popula a large population inversion density. And therefore, we, we would use pulsed pumping for that. Now, the type of system that we are going to uh, use is our uh, Workhorse, the Bro Mosaic virus, a T equals three, 30 nanometer diameter uh, capsid uh, that can be self assembled around uh, uh, nanoparticles and keep its structure the same. It, and it can be uh, by, uh, conjugated by um, established techniques with, with chromophores. These established techniques are uh, depicted here in this cartoon. Uh, we have selected the dye by looking at many dyes. That was just an empirical process. So we are going to work with Oregon Green, which is this one here. These are the particles. They are conjugated post um, by malleolimid coupling. They are conjugated post assembly. They look very nice. And what's more, perhaps uh, far, very important, is the fact that they are more stable than the actual virus. So what does that mean? It means, I think, that the chromophore participates or, or is involved in, at the assembly interface in an active way, which would mean that the particles, the chromophores, are actually lodged in some crevices there that doesn't, don't allow them to fluctuate. So that's why we were really interested in this uh, chromophore. This is the steady state fluorescence as a function of the number of chromophores that we put in on. The, the, we tune the number of chromophores statistically. Okay, so it's a statistical approach. We just use kinetics. Um, you, we start with a free dye here. This is the excitation spectrum. This is the emission spectrum. Free dye. Once you put the chromophores in, you can see that the chromophores have a shifted, uh, the dye has a shifted. Uh, the dye on bromosaic virus has a shifted spectrum, uh, the red shifted spectrum, which means that, again, it's in an environment that, that changes from the polar environment of water to something, to something different, which is probably the, pro the protein. Uh, as we increase the number of chromophores, the, that shift doesn't change much, yeah, which means that we don't get this excitonic coupling I was talking uh, about in the beginning, we only have probably dipole-dipole coupling. There is some fluorescence quenching in steady state. It's not as drastic as we see from many other chromophores. So that, that's another uh, reason we, we chose Oregon Green. Keep in mind, this is steady state. That means one photon at a time is absorbed by the, this collective of chromophores. And we have then delta N, the um, inversion population density approximately zero. So we don't expect to see here uh, super radiance. Isn't it in water? It's in water, yeah. Everything is in water, sorry. Yeah. Um, unless we would lower the temperature so that the two dephasing processes are very uh, long. Then we take pulse pumping. With pulse pumping, we can look at average, the average lifetime. We look by two methods. One is a gated detection. The other one is time correlated, single photon detection. They give us the same result as the number of chromophores per virus. Um, it decays. That could very well be because of uh, non-radiative fluorescence quenching. But 
Let's take a look at the intensity, average counts per particle. And look what happens with respect to this. There's a tail that goes up. As you increase the number of chromophores per particle, the, the fluorescence starts to shoot up. These, then we ask, well, is there some weird statistical effect? Can we do it on a single molecule uh, base, on a single particle basis? And here we have fluorescence lifetime imaging where uh, we look at, uh, with a confocal microscope and a picosecond laser, we look at each particle and we determine the intensity and the lifetime from a single virus particle. We increase the number of chromophores from left to right and here, here you have intensity mapped as gray levels. Here you have lifetime mapped as color levels. Blue means short, green and red means long. And you see it uh, changing as an ensemble without many fluctuations. There are fluctuations, you can, you can actually um, um, quantify them, we can quantify them as histograms. What's really interesting is when we start to hit the 100 chromophore per particle threshold, we have very, very bright particles, single particles, and they, they stand out. So um, those are worth uh, to, uh, to, to study. Um, we don't have the time resolution actually to measure exactly what the burst time is for those particles. But you may, we have uh, asked ourselves, uh, is there a correlation between intensity and, and lifetime? Because that's what the super radiance um, emission would predict. And um, so we plotted the lifetime. This is for three ensembles of particles. Um, that have different number of chromophores, 50, 80, and 100. Um, and we plotted it as a function of the total, this is the intensity per particle. Um, and so we assume the limited, limiting case where tau, the lifetime, is tau naught over n, and the intensity is proportional with n squared, and then if you combine these two, you get that the tau as intensity, the lifetime as intensity, should be a constant over the square root of the intensity minus the background intensity, which we, we found experimentally. So this is not a fit parameter, it's just this unit, uh, unit conversion constant that we use for this dotted line, which looks promising. It passes quite nicely through the, through the data. So what this conclu the conclusion from here is that lifetime shortening does not come from non-radiative quenching. If it did, you would see like these particles here, for these particles here, that's, that's what uh, I think happens. But in our case, for most particles, the brightest ones have the shortest lifetimes. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm actually done. Thank you. Um, so, um, some conclusions. We found that on a 30 nanometer capsid, if you put 150 chromophores of the Oregon green, you are going to get interesting photophysical properties. We don't know how these chromophores are placed on the capsid. We know that they strongly interact with the capsid. Uh, we see suppression of self-quenching we see pulse pumping, bright, and the brightest particles have shortest lifetimes. It could be perhaps not super radiance, but amplified stimulated emission. We are looking into that. Um, we are very much at, in search of theoretical collaborators because this is a, this is a sign I have seen at a, in, in the town of Aspen at, at another, it's actually a street sign. So. Um, that says pretty pictures won't solve anything. This is what I just created for you, but I think that uh, uh, rigorous theoretical uh, analysis of, of our data would be uh, much, much better. And I would like to acknowledge my group, uh, especially uh, Arti Sushma and Irina Tsvetkova, who, who have produced this data last, uh, in, in the short time frame of, of less than a year. Funding from uh, eager from NSF and from the uh, uh, Department of Defense, 
would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to take any questions you may have.